Okay, so we have another uh, panel. This time is going to be on digital transformation. And uh, we have Mindy, Eng, Vinod Raman for Fidelity Investments, Daniel Haas from State Street, Paul Goodman from the Barrel Consulting Group, and Ming, as, as I mentioned, from Barrel Labs. And they will be discussing digital revolution using data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to supercharge customer intelligence. Uh, so I'll leave to Mindy to moderate. Thank you for the introductions, Vidak. So in this panel, we'll be having our panelists talk about their experience supporting the growth of products that use machine learning, machine learning AI, and big data to help improve the pr product experience for their customers. So before we get started, I'd like to go around and have the panelists introduce themselves. Thanks, Mindy. This is uh, Vinod Raman. I am part of the Fidelity Institutional Product Group, um, heading our digital advice solutions group, working really with institutional clients, uh, think of banks, broker dealers, RAAs, and really helping them both from a strategy as well, a, as, well as a product standpoint with their digital advice solutions. Uh, my name is Jeff Nimroff. I'm the CIO of Zeta Global. We are a uh, marketing technology platform and services organization. So we empower our clients to deliver personalized experiences to their customers. So we are a, we're a platform, we're an execution engine, and um, this is a, a pretty auspicious panel for me because this is exactly what we do on a daily basis. We're located at 34th and Madison, we have um, the world's largest permissioned database, and uh, we control, on behalf of uh, our clients, uh, many hundreds of billions of records on behalf of their clients. And uh, we do it all with an eye on personalizing experiences. Hi, Dan Huss. I run product management for State Street Veris. Um, which is a mobile solution that uses uh, machine learning and natural language processing to connect your news that you're interested in back to your portfolio holdings, although I'm sure we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, I was really brought in uh, to kind of focus on helping State Street understand lean startup techniques and really what it means to try to build something truly disruptive within a 225-year-old bank. Um, so I don't look like anyone at State Street. I have tattoos. I don't act like anyone at State Street. But um, it's, been a, it's been a fun journey, so I'm excited to share this with you guys. Happy to have you here. <laughs> uh, Paul Goodman. I'm with uh, Barrel Labs. Uh, we are working on uh, kind of an incubation uh, model to help startups in all aspects of what they need to do in order to kind of become best of class companies. Um, everything from design and branding, marketing, uh, legal, real estate, anything that they might need. And historically what I've been doing uh, is in e-commerce around personalizing the customer intelligence to drive more relevant communications uh, to customers. Thank you, Paul. So let's, start with, let's get started with a little background. So why don't you guys to tell me about how your company currently uses personalization and digital innovation to craft a better product experience for your customers that sets it apart from your competitors. And if you can, I'd love for you to speak to the specific tools or insights that you use to enable those customer experiences. Yep, so I'd actually classify that into three things we are trying to do parallelly. From a product innovation standpoint, we are trying to launch really end-to-end -end digital wealth management platforms for our institutional clients. We recently launched Fidelity AMP. It's a fully white-label robot by solution that a lot of banks, broker-dealers, RIAs are actually using that really simplifies the process of investment management. You can start with a proposal. You can create a proposal in under a minute or two, and then you can quickly get through account opening and funding all within a matter of five to six minutes. It allows for a lot of personalization where we really, really try to profile the end investor's risk profile, give them a very targeted recommendation, and then create a fully digital onboarding experience to the extent that if the institutional client is willing to provide us data, we can almost like pre-fill the entire process and really speed up the onboarding process. 
And then along those lines, we are also trying to do more aggregation to get the holistic view of the end investor's financial profile from various data sources. We aggregate all of that, quickly analyze all of that, and we are able to provide fairly accurate recommendations. So that's kind of like some of the innovation we are doing on the, on the product side. And then if you look at the second dimension, I'd say it's really the delivery aspect of it. Mobile is obviously becoming a big channel. We are trying to do something with voice as well as we speak. Um, and certainly digital is kind of like the primary channel. There's in fact like no way you can go through this process that I was just articulating without using the digital channel. And the third thing I'd stress on is really the technology aspect of it. Um, we think of it in, in essentially two dimensions. How can we make it easier? How can we make everything really fast, really easy, really intuitive? And then second aspect we think of is how can we use the data we have both through aggregation as well as what the investor provides us to really deliver an ongoing personalized experience really based on their needs. And then in terms of the tools we use, we've been doing a lot with Agile. Fidelity is a large organization as well, but in the last couple of years, we've really gotten into a very Agile mindset and that's been a big organizational mind shift. Um, and on top of that, we're also focusing extensively on journey mapping. We are no longer thinking about product capabilities. We are really thinking about customer journeys. And then our KPIs that we are using to measure success are very much tied to the customer journey. Uh, that, great answer. We, we work along the same lines, but we occupy a space that is service-oriented relative to clients such as yourself. So we are a general platform and services company for any organization, and it could be a large financial services client, it could be a large auto manufacturer, could be um, you know, hospitality, could be an airline. And uh, we're really brought in um, to take the place of a large piece of technology as well as a large set of you know, service providers or people who would execute. Um, going back a little bit to the basics, we have a marketing automation platform so we can help any organization deploy campaigns across any channel. Um, it's usually thought of in a CRM context. You bring a first party data set and you know, we can help you personalize experiences to them, um, given a little bit of extra data, right? Data attributes. We know a bit about your clients, each and every one of them. We can tailor messages. That's sort of the straightforward value proposition. Um, we also have, you know, as mentioned, a very large proprietary data set that we've nurtured over the last 10 years through first party relationships. Um, Zeta as an organization runs a lending tree like service called Rate Marketplace. So through those first party properties and through the open web, which is you know, the generic term for any website you may trip over, um, we gather information in that context through web comments. So if you've ever gone to a website and they allow you to provide comments, they might have built it themselves or they would invoke a platform called Discuss. And that's a platform that we provide. And through the provision of that technology, website gains that particular uh, capability. And what we gain is the ability to use machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence on that particular content to derive signals. And we currently talk in terms of signals. The signals could be content you've read, could be something you've commented on, it could be a website you visited. And our database aggregates and accumulates over time that information. And then when you exist with technology at the marriage or the intersection of those two places, that's how we really empower our clients. So you could bring a list of people that you know a lot about and we can, through a matching process, return signals, not data. We don't imbue you or empower you with any rights that you don't already have to data that you've acquired, but we can certainly give you learnings. And from those learnings, we can help you monetize customers better through a personalized jersey, uh, journey. And that's really what we do on behalf of, you know, a very large percentage of the Fortune 100, and we're the, we're the player behind the player. So uh, here's what didn't happen. We did not at any point say, here's this shiny new thing called AI, 
build something in the AI space. We, we definitely aren't a solution looking for a problem. About three and a half years ago, I sat down and did about 75 interviews or so uh, at hedge funds, asset managers, mostly talking to the risk function and to the portfolio management function. And I heard the same things over and over and over again. It didn't take 75 interviews. It took about seven to actually see these trends that were taking place. And the things that we heard were, I can't start my job until 3 p.m. because I'm purely collecting news and other information and trying to understand it. I'm overwhelmed by that. The second thing that we really heard a lot of was, I come in in the morning, I sit at my uh, 9 a.m. meeting, and I'm terrified of being cold called in that meeting where someone says, hey, did you see the latest news on the China trade war? Uh, what's our exposure to that? And no, I have not seen that latest news and I don't have an answer for you. And even if I did see that latest news, to answer that is kind of a hard question because uh, to understand your exposure to something, obviously you have to understand your direct impacts, but there's going to be an, a, a multitude of indirect impacts. And we run scenario, complicated scenario analyses trying to figure these things out. But even in just basic day-to-day -day, uh, simple things like, oh, Apple's in the news about this, what's our exposure to that? Um, it can be more complicated to answer. So it just happens to turn out that this is a really good problem for machine learning to tackle because we're talking about very, very large data sets. So we went out and tried to solve this by creating a machine learning algorithm that reads news using natural language processing. So it extracts what are called entities, the people and places and things that come out of that uh, news article. Uh, we do topic modeling. What is this article uh, about? What is the overall context? We connect those entities that we've extracted and the topics from the news back to your portfolio holdings as State Street. We know that information probably. Uh, from that connection, we're able to, one, say, what are the direct connections to this? All right, Apple's in the news, you own Apple, here's your uh, positions in Apple and related data on that that we've been able to surface, VAR, alpha, beta, whatever, days to liquidate. Um, but in addition to that, that's only answering part of the question of what my exposure is to that news. So let's surface some of the indirect connections that are related to Apple in your portfolio via their supply chain, via other types of relationships. Perhaps they're very highly correlated from a price correlation standpoint. So we'll overall try to paint that better picture of exposure for you. Um, so to this day, uh, we are doing this pretty well. Um, we are running metrics trying to determine are we able to reduce your news feed down to the things that are the single most important? And we've come a long way. We think that we're getting pretty close to being able to do that, as well as supply really interesting analytics on top of that. That's all? <laughs> that's, that's it? So with the companies I've been working with, um, the focus has always been, how do you provide more relevant, personalized messaging to your customers? You know a lot about them. You know what they're buying from you. You know the other websites that they're visiting online. You know a ton of stuff about them. The biggest challenge is how do you provide relevant messaging that speaks to their interaction with you as well as interactions to what's going on around the web and provide it in a manner that speaks to them so that they will engage with you. And so that has been the biggest challenge. It involves pretty large data sets. It involves the ability to not only work with that data, but backing it way up, it starts with asking the question of, okay, I can have access to all of this data, but why do I want it? What is my end goal in terms of engagement? What do I want the customers to do? Starting with that, you need people to actually start to put in place and ask the right questions. Then you can start to put in place these large data sets and ask the data to answer those questions for you. And once you've started down that path, then you can start to take uh, your large customer base and segment them into relevant customer segments. Because the first thing you need to understand is not every customer is the same. They all want to be communicated with individually because we are all individuals. And too many times what we all get on a daily basis is just an influx of information and, and email messages and, and, and direct mail messages that aren't to me. They may be to people who they think I look like, but they aren't to me. They aren't taking into account 
my personal behavior and engagement with them. And so that's been the main focus because when you can start to do that, what you're going to start to find is customers trust you more and that level of trust allows them to engage with you on a more regular basis. So that's really the, the crux of all of this in terms of understanding how you're going to deal with your customers today and as they become more demanding in terms of what they expect from you. Because some companies out there are doing this really well, which makes it really hard on the companies that are not doing it well because it's, it's obvious when you're just sending blanket emails to everybody twice a day, uh, you, your customer knows that that is not relevant. They know that they're just on a mailing list and they start to ignore you. It, it impacts their engagement and their response to you. We, so. we used to call that the spray and pray technique. Exactly, exactly. It's just, gee, I, I, I'm gonna send out a million emails and I hope something happens. And your response goes down and down and down, which triggers, oh, we must need to do more. We gotta send it out three times a day. No, it's not gonna, that's not what's gonna help. What's gonna help is speak to that customer in a much more relevant manner, acknowledge how they interact with you. What do they buy from you? What are they interested in? When they do go to your website, or interact with you in a, in a retail location, what are they asking about? What are they interested in? That needs to be the, the driving factor. There, there is one actual caveat to all of this, which is if you start to remove data because you intuitively believe you understand it, you can often lose strong predictive power, right? Uh, because someone reads something, you derive intent. Um, could have been the time of day could have been what they did off their computer before jumping on the computer. So not that you would have that data, but you, when you run these algorithms and you just let them produce patterns and segments, they're usually or they're often inexplicable. Like how would I explain that correlation or that causation? It's, you know, the time people went to lunch that was, you know, predictive for a certain type of personalization. So exactly. you have to do the targeted but then underneath it or fast following, you really need to churn through as much data as you can to, to you know, really differentiate yourself. Exactly, I mean, how many times have we started to browse uh, different websites, you start to see targeted ads, you buy that item. And then for the next four weeks, you continue to see that item popping up on every single website you visit, whether it's news or sports, and you're just sick of it because, look, I already got it. <laughs> it's, it's good, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I bought it but that hasn't been acknowledged. Yep. And to that point, product innovation is great, but how do you measure whether or not it's doing its job? So how do you measure the success of innovation? How do you attribute it back to big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning? I think we are still evolving that process, right? I think when we said you know, we were gonna do, uh, we were gonna use more data, obviously within, the, you know, broadly within our business and within the products we serve, there were a lot of problems we were trying to solve. I think what we are trying to do now is actually refining the storytelling process and measuring how well people are bringing to us the actual problems they want to solve. I like where you, I like where you are going. We don't want to have a solution without a problem. <laughs> we want folks to be able to define the problem really well. So we are measuring success in terms of how well the different product groups are coming to us and stating the problem they are trying to solve, to be able to accurately define the problem um, and the performance indicators we'd be able to use to measure the solution we come up with is becoming more and more critical. I'd say the second thing we are trying to closely measure is whether our process is working. Obviously by virtue of being a really, really large organization and the number of products and customer segments we try to serve, there we do everything within what we call use cases or problems we are trying to solve. We are trying to develop a process of prioritizing that and coming up with kind of like the right uh, cadence in terms, in terms of using data to be able to, or artificial intelligence or any of those techniques, whether they're even relevant to be able to solve that problem. So we are measuring success against how well we've defined the process. And then the third thing is, is again, like I said, tying your key performance indicators back to the actual problem you are trying to solve. Is it a customer experience um, 
problem you are trying to solve, where we are trying to increase the engagement of the investor? Is it more of a middle office or back office problem you are trying to solve in terms of increasing the efficiency? So really being able to define the problem very clearly up front and being able to come up with performance indicators that truly measure if you've used the right technique to be able to solve for the problem is an art we are continuing to refine. Certainly in the last couple of years, I think we've come a long way, but certainly more work can be done there. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, everyone would be doing it easily if it wasn't hard. Um, so as a technologist, I can say with full certainty that technology is always the answer to a question that no one is asking. So uh, I know that for a fact. If you lead with technology, you're, you're not going to solve the, uh, any of the relevant problems that you want. Um, that notwithstanding, it doesn't mean that technology and techniques and algorithms aren't enabling an enabling element that's part of a really solid process. And to us, the solid process goes down to an understanding of the qualitative aspects, but really the quantitative aspects that we want to measure or do better than, right? So it's experimental testing, which means you have control groups and you have treated groups and you have lots of alternatives that you can offer, right? Uh, someone says, is this better than this, right? If you're throwing darts at a dartboard, one is better, but they're both going to be garbage relative to the universe of good you know, results. So you have to think in terms of broadly defining what it means to personalize a situation or personalize an interaction. You need to rigorously decide how your technology is going to deploy that. And then you need to execute against a control group and execute against a treated group. And then the quantitative metrics play themselves out, right? Did you do better than, you know, random chance, you know, would dictate. Um, and it's also not about, you know, the machine really, machinery really helps when you start to think in terms of the segment of one, your journey building. Um, there's no one right answer. I want to find relative to your control scenario, the best lift relative to yours or mine. So it's often the case that these alternatives that I would show to you and you think they're crap, um, are good for someone else, right, in terms of lift off of control. So working in that rigorous way lets us um, balance the idea of the art and the science when it comes to personalizing. And then the algorithms, you know, churn through and, and they really help you deploy the messaging. Um, it's really, it's a test, it's a test, it's a test, then it's a, a winner, and then there's a set of, uh, you know, uh, deployments after that. And it, uh, it gets really simple once you've decided that that's the way you want to leverage technology. If you're just applying technology, uh, I, you know, I don't know what you're doing, but I'll you know, gladly sell it to you. Pass. <laughs> no, uh, so it, 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 it's hard, right? So if you look at the things that we're measuring, so one, exposure to whether or not you have a better news feed quality than you have out of Bloomberg, and we're reducing the amount of information that you're having to consume on a regular basis, That's an and, and then ranking it in the correct order, that's a completely subjective thing that we're doing. So there are some ways that we attempt to do this. We have subject matter experts who go in and we do statistical spot checking just to see, you know, uh, is, this the, is this the type of quality that you would expect in this feed? Uh, did we have any false negatives where there was a substantial story that broke for that day that for whatever our algorithm shot out? Was there a false positive? Something about Justin Bieber slips into our feed? Um, unless it's Justin Bieber, I don't know. I could imagine some crazy scenario that, that would be appropriate. Um, but ultimately looking at whether this news story is more important than this news story is at the crux of really big data problems because it's a subjective thing for us. But if we're able, because we assign a score to every news item relating back to a por uh, portfolio, if we're able to then look at enough of this over time and say for us, you know, 
a score, a ranking over a certain number uh, can show some sort of signal, um, maybe increased volatility over the next 24 hours, uh, and, and prove out that from back testing, right? Then we, we might be onto something, and that would essentially turn our product into a news factor rating engine. Um, we're not there yet. Um, so right now we're essentially trying to understand whether or not this is just fundamentally helping, helping people do their job. Are they engaging with it? Are they b better able to answer questions? Do they feel, yes feel, whether or not it's true, do they feel better about getting into that Monday morning meeting at nine o'clock? So measuring success, uh, there is no right one answer. Um, every customer segment is going to drive a different right answer. And that's going to be determined by the people who are helping develop what those segments are and that the machines are helping execute against. But every segment is going to have a very different look, a very, very different view of what it looks like when you've succeeded in engaging with that segment. So your, your very best customer, it's not going to be that they're going to just buy more or, or engage with you more, it's exactly how much more are you expecting to get out of them. If you are a, a, an airline, are you expecting them to fly three times as much? Probably not. What you are expecting is, are they going to add that one incremental flight? If you're a car company, you're certainly not going to expect them to buy more cars. But they can engage. They can become um, evangelists of your brand. How do you measure that? You got to set those those things in motion. You have to define how am I going to measure whether this person who has bought seven of our brand over their lifetime are they an evangelist? Are they talking to people about it? If you're a retailer, is that best customer buying across every single category that we sell? And if so, can I get them to just buy one more thing in one category? And if it's not your best customer, how do I turn them into a best customer? But you have to have those segments clearly defined that everybody agrees on and then execute against that. And it, and it starts at the top. For all of this stuff, none of this is going to happen. Just be, Dan didn't create this and then try to sell it up. There was, a, there was a need for it. Somebody defined, yep, we need to do this, and then they decide to execute against it. And for all of this, it starts at the top and it needs to be believed in at the top. And that's the CEO of whatever company has got to buy into and believe it and drive it down through the organization because no one person on the fourth tier of an organization is going to just make stuff happen. So it, 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 there's a lot that goes into this. I think on that point, we were given um, a lot of support from the organization, but we were also given a lot of autonomy, because, which, which is critical. We have an interdisciplinary team where we have you know, my designer who got in trouble for lighting incense in the office, sitting next to one of my elderly risk officers, sitting next to me, a product manager, we're all uh, sitting next to my engineer, all collaborating together. Because if you're not working in that type of interdisciplinary team and getting that autonomy to do that from the top, you're going to have a very hard time. All of this requires massive amounts of iteration and testing. I don't even know what number we're on. I'm going to go ahead and throw out, this is like our 54th version of the product. And that might even be conservative. And that's because we've, we've now gone through a process where we built small little pieces of it to test. A lot of it we did manually in the beginning to test whether or not this was truly solving a problem. Also, the manual nature of us doing it taught us how the machine should start to learn from it, um, which was remarkable to us. Uh, so that autonomy that we had from the top combined with that interdisciplinary team and iteration actually got us to something that was productionalized, which is kind of amazing. Thank you. So I'd like to steer the conversation away from what your organizations are doing in this space to your leadership roles in this space. So I'd like to talk about some pivotal moments in your experience with big data, AI, and machine learning that have changed your perspective and approach to it. I'd say to start off with the type of problems AI and big data can solve, right? When, when I started off, we, we thought about a lot of efficiency plays. You know, can we speed up account opening? Can we speed up 
you know, risk measurement, can we speed up portfolio rebalancing, can we speed up tax loss harvesting, so it was more of an efficiency play. Then quickly we said, hey, can we do more with customer experience, can we personalize the experience based on the data we have and continue to refine that ongoing learning about that investor and sell service in a very seamless, tight, personalized manner. So it's continuing to evolve, and the type of challenges we are continuing to, to solve are, are limitless, right? I think, like you said, it, te the technology can so solve a lot of problems that don't even exist, and we are continuing to see that there is application for using data across a whole series of, of problems, uh, some of which are, are continuing to evolve. I'd say the second thing I'd say was, was important was also the continued focus on privacy and security, uh, especially for a large organization like us, where we are dealing with a lot of institutional clients and a lot of retail clients as well. We have millions of clients on our retail platform. So while we get all this data, service them in, in personalized fashion, we also want to make sure that we are not compromising not just the security of the investor, but also the privacy. Uh, we want to make sure that we that we allow the investor to determine if they are willing to share the data and use the data appropriately. So I'd say that was a that was a really important pivotal moment as well. And then the third thing I'd say is what we've learned through a lot of research we've also done is that investors don't really compare, you know, with their digital experiences, don't really compare a fidelity with, let's say, a Schwab. They compare a fidelity with what with the experience they get on Amazon. So when you're going online, it's always the last digital experience you had. So while we are able to continue to provide those personalized experience, experiences, this is a much more broader game that is industry agnostic. And certainly trying to provide that type of experience in a financial services world, which is much more regulated, um, is uh, an another challenge that we continue to encounter. Um. Great question. So we have, and I won't make light of this, it's probably my most important job. Um, as it relates to data, security, privacy, governance, compliance, all are a, a 24 by 7 uh, job. So that, that notwithstanding, I think the major thing that I've come across repeatedly the last 20 years in, in sort of marketing analytics and the last 10 years uh, with our organization um, garbage in, garbage out really sort of rules the day. Um, so you have to have clean data. You need to understand what exists in your environment. You need to understand what's unique in your environment. And there's going to be a lot of power there, the power to personalize, the power to you know, ultimately drive the metrics that you want. Um, the other part that I think is really important that I mentioned earlier that, that we've learned is uh, once the data is clean, um, no data is innocuous, no data is, you know, sort of underwhelming in its value. If you process it, you can say more definitively that it, it's not really correlating with anything important or causing anything important. Um, where you have gaps, it's often hard to bridge them. And that's really what the technology does, right? It takes data, reams and reams of data, you know, big data, what's you know, now fast data, you know, real-time signals, and it processes it, and it finds patterns. And where there are large gaps in the data, you really can't extrapolate very well. So we make it a point to build from the, you know, the bottoms up. All data that can be provided should be aggregated, ensured for accuracy, and then you can decide what technology you're going to apply or what techniques. And um, the technology has really it's pretty much gotten beyond what's needed for churning through the data, you know, petabytes of data, you know, virtually in real time. Uh, most organizations aren't going to have a challenge um, choosing a technology that can, you know, work with the data that they have. So, again, we go back to basics. We look for clean data. We look to process it in a uh, very robust way, and it really, you know, helps us generate signals on personal information um, that are unique in the industry. I am going to share with you um, a much more personalized version of this. Just kind of that was a bit of an epiphany for me. Um, as a product manager, I'm very good at taking complex information and trying to get individuals to understand that information like designers and other folks. 
So when we set out on this journey many years ago, uh, I did not have a whole lot of data science knowledge that I could uh, pull from and certainly don't know how to build an algorithm. So the epiphany for me, one key moment, was when I realized that this is all just some version of statistics. And now my data scientist in the audience is probably like, that's a way oversimplification. But when you think about it, um, uh, there's a huge chunk of this that you can just look at as applied statistics to unstructured data. And we all do, uh, especially in the financial world, we all do an enormous amount of uh, statistics on structured data constantly. That is like literally our jobs. So when I had this epiphany, I was like, man, this is, this is incredible. All I have to do when I start thinking about how I really want to change the world with AI or data science is think about problems that exist that right now we're not necessarily solving from unstructured data. And when we think about it like that, and by unstructured data, I mean images, I mean text. Um, when we think about it like that, it really helps us understand the types of problems that are appropriate for something like data science to solve. That was a complete changing moment for me. Um, at one point, I asked my data scientist to explain this to me, and he was like, oh, yeah, so we're using Bayesian inference on this. And I was like, cool, cool. Uh, is there a YouTube video where I can watch uh, Bayes talk about this? And he's like, no. No, there's not. Uh, but having a basic level of Bayesian inference and these different kinds of statistical techniques that you don't need a PhD for can really open up the types of things that you can do with AI. Um, I think the, the biggest change that I've seen in personalized or at least marketing communications over the last 20, 20 years has been and it's been talked about a lot today, you've heard this you know, from almost every panel, um, is, is clean data. Um, data used to be really, really clean because it was, it was, there wasn't a lot of it and it was incredibly structured and it was monitored and managed and a handful of people could really own it and, and act on it. And then this wonderful thing called the internet came along and all of that data just got really, really dirty because people just got to do whatever they wanted to do and interact with companies and businesses and, and everybody uh, in their own way. And, and the individual customer, the consumer, made the rules of how they wanted to communicate and how they wanted to interact. And it's taken all this time for a lot of the companies out there to understand it's gonna take a lot for me to control all of this data because there's way too much of it. And so what, what I've seen over all this time is a lot of companies just sort of react and say, okay, give it all to me. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll hire a third party and they'll just, they'll just inundate me with data or they'll say I've got all this data in there and they'll tell me there's, there's a tool to access it. And then they just start to run. <coughs> but they forgot that what they used to do was ask questions, segment their customers, and then use the information they had to answer those questions. And just because all this data was available, they, they threw all that out and then just started spewing out uh, communications and they forgot about how important the individual customer was. So I think we're, we're finally getting to the point where uh, if you look in the news, you see a lot about personalization and how artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to impact personalization. And I think that's going to be the critical turning point to almost go back in time to where you could have true one-to-one -one marketing. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here with us tonight and sharing their stories and insights with us. Before I hand the floor back to Ryan, I'd like to give all panelists a round of applause. <laughs>